So when I was growing up, I was always waiting for the grunion runs. And on these nights, I'd always go to bed, and I wouldn't know anything was happening until I'd wake up at midnight in a minivan crammed with my entire family. We were all packed in there. It was our family tradition, and my mom had been doing it when she was a child. It was something that we were always talking about. And so we'd all pour out onto the beach, and we'd just stand there and wait for the magic to happen. And then, out of nowhere, you'd see this one silvery grunion, this little silver fish. They're kind of like sardines. Uh, and then in the next few moments, you'd see hundreds of them. It's something that's really amazing and something that really inspired on me from a young age. There's, the sand is just made of scales. They're writhing all around your feet. And it's something that was really cool to experience at 1 AM. And so I always went with my family. It was my brother, my grandpa, and we were always there. And so over time, we kept going on these grunion runs. But we saw the numbers start to dwindle. One year, we went, and we stood there. and there were 50 grunion, and next year we went in, there were a dozen. And so we kept going, and year after year, it was kind of declining. And I started to worry that there was some fundamental thing wrong. There was some pattern. And so I got involved with Heal the Bay and beach cleanups and uh, picking up trash and stuff like that. But I started to learn that the grunion were harmed by coastal erosion and by climate change, and that was harming their habitat. So there was something more fundamentally wrong. And so. At the time, I was working at UCLA in a computer science lab on uh, image recognition techniques and image analysis. And so the question became, how do I apply my skill set into the issues that really matter to me? And so I started working at the Lynette Wave Research Group. And I know what you guys are probably thinking is, you're just working at a computer. I thought environmental engineering lab, there'd be some wave tanks and test vials, something like that. And to me, what's really amazing is that you go in there and you see some cubicles, you see people working at desks, but on these computers, there's groundbreaking research that is changing society. And so uh, these are the couple of people I was working with. The guy on my left worked at Google for a while before he came to the lab. The guy on my right uh, was working in Greece. So this is really a global issue, and there's a wide array of people who are working on it. And so I was looking at it in Pacifica, in Northern California, and how it's affecting the, co the houses on the coastline. And then from a broader perspective in Connecticut and how it's affecting Cape Cod and Savin Rock and eating away at the roads. And then going even wider than that in New Zealand, where it's still a really big issue. So we see this as something that's really global. And just by the amount of people who are caring about it, it's, it's something that really affects all of us. But I'm really lucky to be giving this speech at San Marcos, because you guys are all pretty close to a coastline. And it's a very tangible thing. But if I was giving this speech in Nebraska or in Oklahoma or in some landlocked place, I might not have the same audience. And so I mean, I'm sure someone would be saying, great, coastal erosion. I'm getting a beachfront property. But I think the big problem with coastal erosion is that it affects all of us. 29% of the United States popula population lives in coastal counties. Five of the 10 greatest cities in the United States are on the coastline. So we start to think about places like Miami, like Los Angeles, like New York. And these are really social hubs, cultural hubs, and economic hubs in terms of Focusing on the economics, ocean industries, I'm talking about uh, tourism and shipping and fishing, contribute to 4.4% of United States GDP. And that's uh, $258 billion of direct GDP and 375 indirectly, as well as 2.8 million jobs and 2.6 million jobs indirectly. So I, knew it, I know I just threw a lot of numbers at you, but to put that into some perspective, all of the United States agriculture is less than that. So if we start to think about losing every farm in the United States while watching the implications of cities like New York and Los Angeles and Miami decay into the ocean, that's something that really puts it into perspective the scope of the problem we're dealing with. And so the other thing that's really scary about this is that it's actually accelerating. And it's confounded by factors like sea level rise and storms. We just had El Nino. And our own man-made features. So in terms of sea level rise, for every inch of sea level rise, we expect 150 times that in shore retreat. And so it's highly multiplicative, and it's feeding into it. In addition, we start to think about like El Nino and Hurricane Harvey we just had, and we see the implications of that. And so a huge swath of land that was never exposed to the coastline, that we, where we never had to worry about coastal erosion or about sediment loss, this becomes an issue. And that's in addition to the increased wave action and things like that on the coastline immediately during the storm. And then with man-made features like dams, we're 
hindering the natural processes so that when coastal erosion does occur, there's no way for it to recuperate because we're harming the way where it's naturally recovering. And so it's really an issue that we're feeding into. And so there's three main solutions to coastal erosion, three main ways that we're dealing with it right now. The first is seawalls, where in short, you build a physical barrier. And I'm sure you guys have seen it. It's either on the coast or just off the coast. And you hope that this will prevent the wave action from affecting the coast, and it'll prevent the sediment loss. But the thing about seawalls is that they actually make coastal erosion worse in the surrounding area. So in the coast to the north, south, east, or west, there's actually intensified coastal erosion there. And so the cost on society is actually greater than the benefit when you employ a seawall. The second solution that I was looking at is sand dredging. And so we see a similar problem, a lot of the same themes. And that's, it doesn't actually solve the problem. It's more of a Band-Aid solution. We're dealing with the damage and not with the actual problem. So you basically take a bunch of sand and replace the sediment. But over time, this is consistently eroded by more coastal erosion. And again, you have to keep repeating this. So it's highly expensive and extremely temporary. And the third, which I'm hesitant to even call a solution, is managed retreat, where you basically just pick up your stuff and move away from the coastline. <laughs> and I think, I think that really speaks to how dire the circumstances are, that one of our primary solutions is just get out of there. And so since we don't really have a great solution, this was something that really interested me. I was really affected by the grunion. And so I wanted to know, how can we deal with this? And so this is where Calaris came in for me. And the way Calaris works is you start with a just the pure background, there's no land features. You just start off with the waves and seeing how the water's interacting with itself. You can start to toggle the frequency and the amplitude and the wavelengths of these waves. Uh, and so they're modeled just based on the equations and you see how they're working. And then that complexifies and you start to add in some land features and see how it's interacting with a circular island at first. And so you can see instead of just water-water interactions, interactions between the water and the land. And Eventually, you can start to input your own features or your own input into the situation when it's already progressing. And so you can start to play with it and see how the environment's going to react when you change different things. And eventually, you end up with this full model that has a 3D visual of what the coastline's actually going to be like. And it's really amazing because you can build this for any coastline without actually going there or seeing it. You just need to know what the geographic features and the bathymetry, the underwater geography is like. And so this also gives you a depth model where you can work with more numerical data and kind of visualize it in terms of how deep is the water and how high are the waves and things like that. And so eventually, when you start to combine these things, you get a real simulation of what a real coastline is actually like. And so you can start to see how it's going to react to things like sea level rise, which I was talking about before. You start to see how it's going to react to changing geographic features and how these different waves are going to interact with the coastline. And I think it's really amazing because it's this immersive 3D model, but you don't actually have the coastline. So this could be built for any situation. This, this is built for a wide variety of different coastlines. And you can see how each environment is going to react as you start to change your inputs. And so this gives us insight into the future. And so I think what's really amazing about Calaris and about predictive modeling is that it gives us a way to improve our current solutions, but it also helps us build into the future. So if we start looking at seawalls, we can start to say, when is the cost benefit actually worth it of building a seawall here versus the societal damage it's actually going to cause? Or when is it worth the sand dredging to replace the sediment versus when it's going to be lost in a year or two? And then my favorite, in terms of managed retreat, when do we actually have to go, and when can we just sit there and hope for the best? And so. I think that it's really amazing in that it employs the solutions that we already have. So right now, it's already effective. But on the other hand, there's a lot of ways this can improve future solu solutions. And uh, the Netherlands, they've been using predictive modeling. And they've, they've made predictive and preemptive action a huge part of their culture. They actually have swim tests where you have to swim with all your clothes on by the age of five because they're so sure that there's going to be these problems with the water. And so it's really about not trying to defeat nature or, or defeat coastal erosion or these issues, but learning to live with them. And so they have something called the Eindrox folder. Uh, excuse my pronunciation on that, if any of you are Dutch. Um, 
But it's basically a 22-acre plot of reclaimed land. And it's really amazing because on one hand, it's contributing society. They held the World Rowing Championships there one year. But on the other hand, it also places a crucial buffer between the key structures of society and the coastal erosion, so that when coastal erosion does occur, it's not immediately harming houses or the main city or metropolitan areas. And so if there's one takeaway I want you guys to have from all this, it's not directly related to coastal erosion. It's, I think it's a bigger theme. And so we're in the 21st century. We have this insight into the future that we've never had before. And there's a way to predict what's going to happen. But this makes our old solutions outdated. We used to be reactionary and dealing with problems when they came to affect us. And dealing with the symptoms of, the, of coastal erosion, but not necessarily with coastal erosion itself. I think we need to be more proactive and worried about our future and taking accountability. So that way we're not standing there in the middle of the night on an empty beach waiting for the grunion when it's already too late. Thank you. <laughs>